thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with a little four-minute video because I'm getting so old that I know a lot of you weren't even born practically when I played and stuff. So it's just a little four-minute video that kind of recaps my career. So I'll go ahead and show that to you now. Jackie Stiles dominated women's basketball like few others ever have. With her patented spin moves, fadeaway jumpers, dead-eye accuracy from long range, and the ability to drive the basket, Jackie Stiles is a player fans from all across the country wanted to be like. Jackie's drive to success began in her hometown of Claflin, Kansas. Jackie made the most of her high school experience. She was a four-sport athlete in high school. She ran track and cross country, where she earned 14 gold medals and was the first athlete in Kansas history to run the 400, 600, 1600, and 3200 meter races. On the tennis court, Jackie had a career record of 81 wins and only 12 losses, while leading her squad to three second place finishes in state. But it was on the basketball court where Jackie made her mark. In Jackie's freshman season at Claflin, she averaged over 29 points per game and was named to the Associated Press All-State First Team and earned a spot on the USA Today Top 10 Freshman America. By her senior year, Jackie averaged over 46 points a game and established a state record by scoring 71 points in a single game. She scored more than any other boy or girl in Kansas history with 3,603 career points. She was selected to the USA Today and Parade All-American First Teams and was one of only 12 players selected to play for the U.S. Junior World Championship team. Jackie was the most sought-after high school player in the country, being recruited by national powers such as Connecticut, Tennessee, Kansas, and the list goes on. She followed her heart to Springfield, Missouri and Southwest Missouri State University, and the rest, as they say, is history. Top of the key to Jackie. Jackie, she'll fire up a three. This could be it. It is! did everything they could to stop her, but Jackie's hard work and dedication to the game made it impossible. Single, double, triple teaming didn't seem to matter. Jackie made her mark on the record books. Rebound comes down. Oh, here, long pass down. This could be it. Jackie right side. Layup. Good. And there it is. Jackie Stiles, the all-time leading Missouri Valley Conference scorer. A standing O at the Hammond Student Center. Everybody knows about that. And on March 1st, 2001, Jackie set the NCAA all-time scoring record. Jackie, three-pointer left side. Yes! Boom! There it is! Jackie Stiles with 20 points, and she is the all-time scoring queen in NCAA history. Jackie would go on to lead the Lady Bears into the NCAA tournament. She and the Lady Bears would pick up wins over national powers Rutgers, Duke, and Washington and into the player's dream, the Final Four. And there you have, you see why she's an All-American, averaging 30 points a game. Jackie earned just every postseason honor there was her senior season, including the prestigious Wade Trophy. Jackie was named Kodak First Team All-American and also earned First Team All-American honors from Sports Illustrated, the Associated Press, the United States Basketball Writers Association, Verizon Cosida, and she won the Broderick Cup as the Women's College Athlete of the Year. Jackie was ESPN the Magazine Shooting Guard of the Year and for the third time in a row was named the Missouri Valley Conference Player of the Year. The Missouri Valley Conference honored Jackie as her Female Player of the Century and they named the Women's Basketball Player of the Year Award after Jackie. In the classroom, Jackie was just as successful as she earned academic All-American honors as well. Jackie! In 2001, Jackie was a fourth overall pick in the WNBA draft by the Portland Fire. As in college, Jackie was the buzz of women's basketball. Gives to Styles at the foul line. Jackie creates, goes to the rack and scores. Making something out of nothing. She would go on to earn a spot on the WNBA All-Star team and was named the 2001 WNBA Rookie of the Year. Jackie's playing career was one that every player dreams of, and she has dedicated herself to helping young athletes all around the country achieve their dreams. 
interested in Jackie's camps, clinics, teaching videos, speaking engagements, or even personal training sessions, Jackie can be contacted by the following information on your screen. To be the best, learn from the best, and make your dreams come true. decide what to talk about, I decided I would tell my story and kind of how my life experiences have made me the person I am today. And, um, you know, I believe the keys to my success will carry over and help you be successful in whatever it is that you want to achieve. And I, I know the topic is wellness. And so um, at the end of my talk, I'm going to leave you with 10 keys that I believe are important to uh, getting in shape and staying in shape. And um, if we have time, I'll um, also open it up for questions. But, um, you know, looking back, uh, my four years in college were some of the best four years of my life. And I just want you to realize um, what a tremendous opportunity you have during this time. And, and my goal today is to inspire you to do more and be more than you ever thought you could be. Um, because these times will go by quick, and I just want you to make the most of these opportunities. Um, I grew up in a very small town, Claflin, Kansas, a town of 600 people, and I was very fortunate that my dad was a basketball coach, so I would follow him to the gym, and he would show me how to dribble or shoot, and I couldn't wait to show him how I mastered it, so that's really how the love of the game started for me, and I always knew from a very young age exactly what I wanted to do, and now I look at what a blessing that was, but I told my uh, second grade teacher that I was going to play professional basketball one day. And that was before, you know, the WNBA even existed. You could go overseas as a woman and play professional basketball. But I just had that vision at a very young age. Um, and then another, uh, you know, kind of a, a big moment or um, time I went through was when I was 12 years old. And I've actually never really spoke publicly about this. But um, I get the question all the time, where does your drive come from? And um, a lot of people don't know this, but I was the oldest of uh, five children, and uh, um, I lost my baby sister when I was 12, and, uh, you know, I was kind of a caretaker because my parents both worked, um, had crazy schedules, so I was always the one, you know, kind of uh, watched her and her, and, um, you know, that was a very, very uh, tough time for me, um, and I vowed at that moment that I would dedicate all my accomplishments to her, and she became my inspiration because I know she would have made something of herself, so, you know, I wanted to, um, you know, be special in honor of her, and, and that's really where my drive has come from, and we're all going to face tough times in adversity, and I know all of you out there have had very, very difficult times, and, it, and if you can just somehow find a positive when you're going through those tough times and, and turn it into a positive, because what other choice do you have, you know, and and, you know, she, you know, she really inspired me, and, and that's where my inspiration came from. But um, uh, shortly after that, and I truly believe, um, you know, God has a purpose and puts uh, people in your life at, at the right time. So this was in February. Um, shortly after that, I'm playing in my first AU tournament, and I think it about caused my mom and dad to have a divorce because my literally my dad would drive me four hours to Kansas City um, each way, so eight-hour trip for a weekend practice to be on this AAU team, and she could not understand why <laughs> we had to drive eight hours to put me on this AAU team. So it's not like it is now where there's bitty basketball and all kinds of opportunities. So um, I'm playing on this team, and it's my first AAU game, and there happens to be a coach from Missouri State there, and she says, uh, you know, she leans over to my dad and says, who's that number five? And my dad's like, well, that's my daughter. So she stays after the game. And she says, you know, if you keep working, you know, you could one day play Division One basketball. And I remembered watching them. This was a spring after they made the Final Four. And I remember watching them on TV. And they are like, you know, we'd love to have you come to camp. And that's when I really knew, you know, I want to play Division One basketball because I'm from a town of 600 people. I didn't really know how good you had to be, hoping maybe I could walk on somewhere. Um, so, you know, that was, that was huge for me. Um, then on to high school, I was a four-sport athlete. I did uh, cross-country and tennis in the fall, basketball, and then uh, track. And another uh, kind of crucial point in my career was my sophomore year in high school. I go up for a reverse layup, the third game of the season. I break my right wrist. 
and I think my world is coming to an end. You know, I'd never missed a practice, a game, anything. So I have to sit out four weeks with a cast past my elbow. Um, so in that time, I taught myself how to shoot left-handed and play left-handed. So I get the cast off, or actually, they put a soft cast on my arm, so I still can't use it. It's past my elbow, but I wouldn't hurt anyone else with the soft cast. So they let me play four weeks left-handed. Talk about <laughs> very difficult, but <laughs> I, uh, I played four weeks left-handed. I get the cast off right before playoffs, and my whole goal in high school was I wanted to win a state championship, and I wanted to win a state championship more than anything. So here we are, semis of the state tournament, and I had the worst performance of my career. It was so bad that I still to this day remember what I was from the field, and that was a lot of years ago. I don't want to tell you how many, but I was four out of 21. I only made four out of 21 shots, and we only lost by a couple points. And right then and there, you know, I was just so disappointed. I was devastated, embarrassed. I felt like I let my team down. And at that moment, it would have been so easy for me to, you know, just quit and walk away and say, you know what? You know, I'm not going to devote this much time to basketball anymore. It's not worth it. But I said, you know, I want to be better than before this injury. And that's when I vowed to make a 1,000 shots every single day. And that was before the gun existed where, you know, it, pa it has a big, huge net and it passes several basketballs to you. I had to use um, a toss back, which is just a square with a net, and you put it up, you know, under the goal, and if you make it, it'll bounce it back to you. But if you don't, it'll, you know, ricochet off and you have to run after it. So it would take me four hours um, with the toss back. And if I could bribe one of my younger brothers and sisters to, you know, because who wants to stand there while I make a thousand shots, um, it would cut it down to two hours. So, um, you know, but if it wasn't for that injury or that adversity, you know, I don't know if I would be standing before you today. So that's why it's so important to know what you want to accomplish because when you face those tough times or those difficult times, you'll push through it because you, you want it bad enough. You'll, you'll work through it. So um, that was a big moment for me. Uh, then on to my senior year in high school, and I have to decide where I'm going to go to college. And I did not handle this process very well. I hope you all ha um, had an easier time uh, choosing jury. But, uh, oh, man, I, uh, you know, from a small town, no one had been recruited. So I uh, didn't have really anyone to learn from. Plus, I have a hard time saying no. So not a good combination. I had 18 home visits in 19 days. And this is the fall of my senior year in high school. And I'm doing two sports. So I'm doing uh, cross country and tennis. And I, I remember, you know, my day would start at 6.30. You know, I would um, end school at 3.30, go to 3.30, 5.30 with tennis, 5.30, 6.30, 6.30 cross country. 7 o'clock, the school's at my home. And Claflin is so small that we don't have a restaurant. So. My mom cooked for every single one of those coaches, and it kind of became a community event where they were bringing over casseroles and different things to help out. But uh, so literally, um, you know, and if I had a cross-country meet, they'd show up at that, then come to my home, and literally every night would end at midnight or 1, and then it would start over the next day. And Claflin's like two hours from Wichita, which is the big airport. So um, a lot of these coaches were flying into Great Bend, which is very, very small airport, and um, it's about 20 minutes from my home. But every day we'd look outside, and there was that same white rental car because Great Bend only had one rental car. So that kind of um, gives you an indication of how uh, small a town I'm from. But uh, um, so anyways, uh, I finally narrowed it to three schools, and it's Missouri State, UConn, and Kansas State. And let me tell you, I really struggled when I got to this point because I felt like all three schools would have been a good fit for me. And I uh, struggled so much, um, I hate to admit it, but it's a true story, that I actually called the psychic hotline. I saw it advertised. <laughs> and, you know, the longer you stay on it, you know, the more they're going to charge you. So literally, like, I'm like, I just have one question. And I think I actually got so many minutes free. So um, <laughs> I go... I can't decide where to play college basketball. These are my three schools. And the psychic's like, well, personally, I'm a Tennessee Lady Balls fan, so I'd like to see you go there. And uh, so, yeah. Um, but then uh, she's like, well, I guess uh, Connecticut. So I actually signed the letter of intent to play at UConn, not, not on her advice. But uh, and I was going to sleep on it. And if it felt right, I was going to turn it in. And I, I knew the next morning that that was not where I wanted to go. And, and looking back, the reason I had such a difficult time is I was trying to listen to where everybody else wanted me to go. I mean, 
I had a lot of pressure to stay in state with Kansas State to the point where people were taking out ads in the paper, begging me to go there, uh, sending me flowers to my home. Um, and then when I would mention UConn, they'd be like, why would you even consider going anywhere else? You'll have a chance to play for a national championship every year. You'll be on national television. But I was very close to my family, and I knew um, they would not be able to afford to get to watch me play very much in person. And then when I would say, at the time, it was Southwest Missouri State, they'd be like, well, why do you want to go to a Division II school? They didn't understand, like, the type of program, and that was Division I school, and that's why we've had the name change, Missouri State. But, um, you know, like, really no one could understand why I was considering Missouri State. But I, I knew they'd been to a Final Four, and, and I knew Coach Burnett would push me on and off the floor, and that's, that's what I wanted, and, and I, I knew about their fan support. So I understood, but... I was finally able to say, you know what, this is where I want to go, even though it was a sad day when I signed. I mean, I had to sign real quiet because everybody was so disappointed. But let me tell you, the best decision of my life. So if you're trying to make a difficult decision, you can weigh other people's opinions. But bottom line, you're the one that's got to live with that decision, and you have to follow your heart and your gut, and I guarantee it will work out for you every single time. And um, when I entered Missouri State, my goal was – to play in a Final Four, and I did not want to leave school without doing that. And um, so it's my senior year. We made the NCAA tournament every year, but we fell short. We never even made it to a Sweet 16, so I have one year left. I've never worked so hard in my entire life. Um, senior year went really smooth. We uh, actually won the conference tournament championship for the first time since I'd been there. So now we're going into the NCAAs with some momentum. And we actually felt like we even might get to host um, – but unfortunately, the committee did not agree with us because the top 16 teams would get to host, and with our attendance, we felt like we might get it. And unfortunately, they sent us clear across the country to New Jersey, and we saw that it was going to be a very, very tough draw because um, we played Toledo in the first round, and it looked like we were going to be matched up with Rutgers, who um, was a Final Four team the year before, had never lost a home game um, the year before and still had not lost a home game and had everybody back from that Final Four team. So, and they were extremely athletic. So we knew it was going to be very, very tough. Um, but we were able to somehow beat them on their home court. And I'm so happy that we had to play Rutgers on their home court because by beating them there, that gave us the confidence that, you know what, hey, we can beat anyone. And we sure did need that confidence because then we had to fly clear across the country to Spokane, Washington to play number one seeded Duke. And I'm telling you, no one at all gave us a chance versus Duke. I mean, the commentators were talking about how we had a nice run, but it was about to come to an end. And, but it didn't matter because every single person in that locker room believed we could do it. And we were actually down 10 points at half, and we were able to come back and win. And we knew at that point nothing was stopping us from the Final Four, and we actually beat Washington to an advance. And I'm telling you, there is not a better feeling in the world than when you accomplish a dream. And even more importantly, it was looked at as an impossible dream. I mean, no one really thought we could do it. And I'll never forget the scene when we flew back to the Springfield Airport. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you maybe have been in the airport at some time. It's very small. Usually it takes you 15 minutes to get through there, get your bags, and get out. Well, this was before 9-11, so people could go right up to the gate. We step off the plane, and I am telling you, it was pandemonium. It was wall-to-wall -wall people. I mean, people were trampling other people to get our autograph and picture. I mean, Sports Illustrated was there, um, USA Today. I mean, it was, it was wild. It was, it was a special scene for women's basketball. I'll never forget it. It actually took us three hours to get um, to our luggage and get out of the airport just to kind of – you know, give you an idea how crazy it was. And so then the cool thing was we got to bus to the Final Four because it was in uh, St. Louis. So um, I know I'm a little biased, but I've been to several Final Fours, and I swear there hasn't been one with that kind of electricity because here we are, a Cinderella, which doesn't usually happen much in women's basketball, and we're the hometown team. Um, but unfortunately, our run came to end uh, against Purdue. Um, we lost in the first round, and that's all I'm going to say because it still hurts so much to this day. I can't talk about it. I can't watch the game. So um, we'll move on. But uh, it was a, a, a memorable run and a, um, a great experience. Um, then, you know, just when I think that my life can't get any better, um, I get drafted 
by the WNBA as the fourth pick to play for the Portland Fire. And talk about a dream come true to get paid to play basketball. I mean, to get paid, you know, for something that you truly love and that you would never consider work. Um, so on to my rookie season. And uh, I, I'm just going to tell you a couple stories from my uh, WNBA experience. Um, you know, here, here's an example of a small town girl uh, adjusting to um, – you know, life in the WNBA. We travel like the men, so um, we, except for, you know, we would take commercial flights, they would charter, which that's a big difference. But as far as the hotels, we would stay in the nicest hotels. We would stay in the Ritz Carlton's, the W's, hotels that I never thought I would be staying in. Uh, the, other, the biggest difference, though, is the salaries. Um, but I, I had no complaints. You know, I'm getting paid to play basketball, and it was basically a summer job because the WNBA goes from May until uh, early September. So a lot of players go overseas and then play a full season there or, you know, have other jobs during the off season. So um, no complaints, but I was the fourth pick. And so the top four players got 55,000, okay? Um, and in the NBA, the last player on the bench, last I heard was making 300 and some thousand. So as a minimum. So, you know, obviously, you know, pretty big difference there. So. When we would travel, we would get meal money. And, you know, we would try to kind of eat cheaper to, you know, pocket our $100 a day for meal money. So uh, I remember um, I was, I didn't eat right after a game and we were in Phoenix and I was hungry. So I went down to um, talk to my trainer because she would always carry protein bars and stuff because I was not going to order room service at the Ritz because, you know, the cheapest thing would have been maybe $30, $40 just for a little sandwich. and. Uh, the thing about those really, really nice hotels, they don't have vending machines and things like that because they figure you're just going to order room service if you're staying there. So um, there was a couple of my teammates, and my trainer was like, oh, you know, you need to eat more than that. They're like, you know, there's a Wendy's um, not too far from here. Let's just go and order off the late night uh, window. And so um, we were going to just call a cab. So we go to the concierge that calls the cab. and. Uh, they're like, your car's here, and um, little did we know that they don't allow cabs to pull up to the Ritz-Carlton entrance. So we get out there, and there's a limo. Um, so we took a limo to the late-night window at Wendy's and ordered off the 99-cent menu. So by the time we took a limo to Wendy's, uh, it would have been cheaper just to, you know, order the room service. But uh, anyways, uh, so... Um, I, I made it through my rookie season, but really my body um, started to kind of break down towards the end. Um, I just had played for s so long. Actually, before my senior year in college, I made a USA basketball team because my ultimate dream was to be an Olympian. And so to do that, you have to make teams when you're younger um, to get international experience. And so I basically had made a USA team. That's a, like a whole season. Then I uh, went into my college season. We made it all the way late. And then, you know, I literally had less than a month to turn around and report to training camp for my rookie season. Um, so my body started, you know, really break down. So my second season, um, you know, before my second season, I had to have right wrist surgery. And I just really could not get the motion back in it. So I was starting my season not really healthy. Um, and then it wasn't four games into my second season that my Achilles just explodes on me. And you know, so long story short, um, I, I stuck out that season, but I didn't know at the time, but I was playing with a torn rotator cuff in my right shoulder, um, a wrist that needed surgery, and also a partially torn Achilles. Um, so I stick it out, and I mean, I did not play one good game the whole season. Um, I lost my starting spot, and here we are, the second to last game of the season. If we win this game, we'll make the playoffs. And I said to myself, I did not stick this season out for nothing. And so the day of the game, and I want to share the story with you because it really shows you the importance of your mental focus and just believing in yourself and having that confidence. So I get up and I rehearse, you are the best player on that court. No one can stop you. You're going to do whatever it takes to win the game. And I just kept rehearsing it over and over in my head. Um, and obviously I wasn't near the best player on the court. I wasn't even starting. So sure enough, I, I get put into the game. I hit my first three. I hit my next three. I literally had the one of the best games of my WNBA career. And I couldn't even warm up because if I would shoot too many shots, my shoulder would die on me. 
so that just showed me the, I mean, because I was literally able to convince myself immensely that I was like my old healthy self. Um, so that just taught me a powerful lesson on how powerful your mind is and believing in yourself and, and having that confidence. Um, it also taught me a powerful lesson on your health and how important that is. If you do not have your health, you have nothing because after that second season, I went through basically 13 surgeries in a four-year span. Um, man, talk about <laughs> a lot of rough times. And, you know, there'd be times where I would need an upper body surgery and a lower body surgery, so they'd have to kind of stagger them, you know, so I could be on crutches. You know, it, it, it really made me appreciate my health um, going through that. So I hang in there. I make one final attempt to come back in 2006, and I go to Australia. And I, I made it back from all those um, injuries, and I had a new one, um, uh, basically my left knee. And uh, I the, they sent me to the doctor, and the doctor's like, this is the worst case of teller tendonitis I've ever seen. I'm not going to let you play on it. And so basically that was it for me, and I got sent home from Australia. And, you know, at that moment I knew it was time to retire. You know, my body could not do it. It was just like an old car. One thing after another was breaking down. My mind wanted to do it. My body couldn't. Um, and, yeah, it wasn't the way I wanted to end my career, but – I had no regrets because I knew I had given it everything I had, you know, to try to continue to play. So um, kind of on to the next chapter. Um, basically, I started my own business um, in 2007, and it was J Styles Total Training. And that consisted of personal training and basketball lessons, and then I would do camps and clinics. Um, and, and that was going well, and I actually moved. I was living in Wichita at the time when I started my business, Wichita, Kansas. Um, and then I moved to s back to Springfield in 2009, and business was going really well. And, and throughout the time since I retired, um, you know, I love to compete. Um, and, you know, at one point I got into cycling. I was competing there because that was one thing that didn't hurt my body. Um, then when I moved to Springfield, I got inter introduced to yoga. And honestly, I would still be playing right now if I knew now how to take care of my body. I just didn't know back then, and, uh, you know, yoga did wonders for me. I, I literally could not run at all at that point, so I was into yoga. Um, I would always do non-impact cardio, because I always tell people working out is my drug of choice. I mean, it's like eating, breathing. I mean, I have to work out every single day. I'm, I literally am, I know, addicted to it, because it's funny. When I take my days off, because I make myself take my days off, I have the problem where I want to do too much, so literally, when I take a day off, I'll have a headache. And sometimes, like, if I kind of cheat on my day off and I work out later that night, my headache goes away. I mean, I, I swear it's like withdrawal symptoms. I know. I'm kind of crazy. But uh, um, so anyway, uh, I get into yoga, um, and I do it for a full year. Um, and my body starts to feel really good. And so I decide to go for a run. And, man, you know, I felt great. So I'm going to blame it all on you because I actually entered the jury, the Panther run. It was, and I somehow got lucky and I won that race and I was like, oh, I love this, you know. So, of course, you know, I can't just go and enter a race every now and then occasionally for fun. I decide that I want to try to qualify for the Olympic trials in the marathon. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So I start this in August. Um, and this was um, 2011, um, and I start working out with our cross-country team at Missouri State. Yeah, what am I thinking? Like, you know, I'm, I don't want to, in my 30s, and I'm trying to run with these young college girls, you know. But uh, so anyway, I start um, that, and uh, I have to have, basically what you have to do is you have to have a certain time by, um, uh, it was like December 11th of um that you had to have a certain time to make it to the trials. And you could run it in a half or a full. And so I didn't think my body could take full marathons, so I was trying to get the certain time on in a half marathon. And you just had to do it as sanctioned course. Um, you could do it whenever you wanted to, it's just as long as it was before December 11th, um, 2011. And so um, I ended up, my fastest time was 118, and I needed a 115, so I didn't make it. And in that time, I pretty pretty much destroyed my body for the I don't know how many times. Um, so I literally couldn't run, couldn't, and I vowed at that moment, okay, I'm not competing anymore. If I could just have the abil ability to run again for fun, there's no more competitive stuff, 
in my future. And, and that's when I kind of was really bored with my business. I mean, it was going great, but something was missing. And everybody's like, why aren't you posting? I would get that all the time. And I always said, well, you know, if the right, time, if the right opportunity happened, you know, I might try it. But I was kind of spoiled because, you know, I was, I owned my own business. So I was, you know, I worked a lot of hours, but, you know, I got to decide my schedule. And uh, so out of the blue, I get a random text, and it's from um, Coach Charity Elliott, who actually played at Missouri State. And she played on the first Final Four team. And she was now the coach at LMU, which is in Los Angeles. And she's like, do you want to be my assistant? And I thought to myself, oh, first of all, like, no, that's crazy. Move clear across the country. I just bought a home. It's only like a couple years I'd had it. Um, you know, what they were offering me for pay was not even half of what I was making. Plus, the cost of living, just to give you an example, um, it, it was over twice what it is here in Springfield. So, But I was like, you know, why not? And um, you know, most people thought I was crazy. They're like, what are you doing? You know, I mean, because basically my rent for the smallest one-bedroom um, apartment that I've ever lived in my life was $2,200 a month, okay? And, you know, my four-bedroom, two-bath, all-brick home was $900 a month here in Springfield. So, you know, it was pretty crazy. But I've always said, you know, when I'm trying to make a difficult decision, could I live with the worst-case scenario? Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a, a great way to look at it when you're, when you're trying to weigh your options. If, if the worst case thing happens, are you going to be okay? And I thought, I get out there, I hate it, okay, no, no problem. I've rented my home, I'll just come back, and I'll restart my business. So I went for it, and thank goodness I did. Um, instantly I knew that the coaching was what I was supposed to do. And, you know, you got to really try to find that something that you love um, and don't worry about the money because if you're passionate about it and you're and you love it um, All of those other things will take care of itself And I realized that it kind of fulfilled that competitive uh, Void for me to try to build a team and then you know just to show my players a different move And then to see them do it on the court. I was like a proud mom. I was like, oh, you know I, I, I love this and so, you know, I look back and I realize that I was very selfishly focused in the first half of my career it was all about how good can I become? I mean, I woke up every day, how can I become the best basketball player I can possibly become? And I realized so many people sacrificed for me to do that. Um, and, and now, you know, I, I just want to give back and help others, you know, be better and do more and accomplish more things. And so, you know, I, I really am so glad that I, I took that jump. But I knew that, you know, I, I did my year in, um, at LMU, but I was missing the Midwest because I, I cannot tell you, I can't even put into words what the traffic like is like in LA. I mean, I'm not exaggerating, 15 miles most oftentimes will take you over two hours. I'm like, I could run, you know, faster than that. I mean, it, you just sit in a car, it does not matter what time of day, and then when you get to where you're going, there's nowhere to park. I mean, it, it, it was a hard, hard life <laughs> for a year. Um, yeah, the weather's great, but my job was so demanding, I never got outside to enjoy the sun. So um, I really wanted to get back to the Midwest, and, and fortunately, um, you know, uh, I got an opportunity at Missouri State. Um, when Kelly Harper was hired, she called me and, you know, and, uh, you know, was interested in hiring me, and I met her for five minutes, and I knew instantly that I could work for her, and, and I've always said that. I would only work for somebody that I would want my daughter to play for because that's the only way I could sell her in the program. And um, instantly, I didn't have to call one person. And, and normally, like for instance, when I bought my first home, it, I was the slowest home buyer ever. I had to see every home a zillion times. I know I drove my realtor crazy. So for me to know instantly, and then actually, um, I just bought my second home and it took me uh, less than two hours. So um, I've gotten better at it. But uh, um, I knew I could work for her, and I just, um, I feel so blessed that I had this opportunity at Missouri State. I haven't been this happy since, really, I played at Missouri State. Um, you know, so um, I just, you know, want to go over for a few things that I believe were truly keys to my success to, um, you know, putting me in that point. And like I talked about a little earlier, you really got to find your passion. I mean, find something that you really enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis. Even if it's less money than what you're doing now, 
I'm telling you, it, it will reward you. It will pay off because it's something you truly love. Um, also, you truly have to believe in what you're trying to accomplish, and you have to believe it greater than other people's doubts because you will be doubted. You will go through adversity. You will go through tough times, and you have to just continue to believe, you know, that you can do it because I've always been the underdog. I mean, people, you know, when I said I was going to play professional basketball and I was from Claflin, Kansas, they looked at me like I was crazy, you know. Um, and then, you know, being from a town of 600, they said, you know, I need to be at a big high school to play Division One. And then it was, you'll never be an All-American at uh, Southwest Missouri State. You need to go to a major Division One school. So, you know, I've always, um, you know, had the naysayers, but you just have to believe in what you're accomplishing. Um, the third thing is you can't accomplish anything alone. You've got to find that support um, to help you get there. Um, and I look back, I, I've been so fortunate to have so many amazing people um, help me get where I am today. Um, and then probably, you know, if I had to put one thing on, if, if I had to say one thing that was the most crucial thing to my success, I would definitely say work ethic. I mean, you can't take shortcuts. Um, you have to put the work in. And just to give you a quick little story, I'm, I'm a proud uh, older sister, but my brother, um, the next in line, um, one day he just said, I want to be a doctor. And we're like, what? You know, where did this come from? He was a, a good student, but, you know, not brilliant, not all A's by any means. Um, and so he's not a great test taker, so the first time he took the MCAT, he didn't get a high enough score, didn't get accepted. So he decides he's going to go for it again. So he takes the test again. He literally, I don't know how he does this, but preparing for that second test, every single weekend he took a practice test of the MCAT, which is four hours. Like, I could not sit there four hours every weekend. I'm high energy, so I do not know how he did it. But it paid off. He got accepted. And when he graduated KU, they give out a top honor, and it's um, the students and then the deans and the professors they all vote, who would you most like to have as your doctor? And my brother got that award. And it was just because he worked so hard and wanted it so bad. And now um, he's in his residency in Wichita, Kansas um, for surgery. And he just got named the top surgical resident. So um, I always tell people I'm the underachiever of the family because uh, my youngest sister is also in uh, med school right now. And uh, she hasn't gotten a B. So, um, and I have one other brother that um, will be officiating Division One basketball. So uh, I'm pretty proud of my um, younger brothers and sisters. But, um, and then the last thing is, is just, and I wish I would have done a better job of this, is enjoy the journey. Um, don't get so focused on what you're trying to achieve or the end result. Enjoy the day-to-day. -day. I mean, truly enjoy it. Um, and then um, I'm going to leave you with my, uh, my keys to um, getting fit. Um, I got 10 keys here, not in any sort of order, but I've found that they've really helped me stay in shape. Um, first, uh, don't be all or nothing, all right? You know, um, just try to stay consistent. So let's say you go out to lunch with some coworkers or um, some of your friends, and you totally go off, you know, just go nuts. You know, it's two burgers, fries, a milkshake. Okay, don't say, oh, okay, well, the rest of the week I'm not going to eat healthy because I just blew it, you know. Just get back on track, you know, just th that night for dinner, yeah, then just, you know, eat a sensible dinner. So just try to stay consistent. Don't beat yourself up. Everybody has those moments, all right? Just try to stay consistent. Um, you can't outwork out a bad diet, um, even though I like to uh, try sometimes. You know, I love, um, you know, people are like, you eat donuts and pizza? Yes, I do, but I do work out cr like a crazy woman, and I've uh, tried to balance that out a little bit because I don't get paid to work out anymore, so I've had to learn to cut those back. But um, third, cut out calorie drinks. You can find so many great drinks, you know, that don't have calories in them. So um, I suggest trying to cut that out. Um, my philosophy on diet is 80-20. So 80% 80 of the time, you know, try to just eat, eat healthy, make good, smart choices. And 20%, do what you want. All right, but 80-20. Um, find a workout partner. It is so much easier when you have somebody that you're meeting to work out. And it doesn't matter if it's a walk, you know, meeting them at the gym. Find somebody that you can meet to hold you accountable. And I use it for my social time. I love 
to meet my friends to work out because that's also when we get to catch up with each other's lives. So um, find a partner. Um, it's easier to stay in shape than it is to get back into it. And I've experienced this a ton with all my injuries. And I see why people quit because I would, you know, be on crutches, then I would start getting into shape, and it would hurt so bad those first couple weeks. But I knew what was on the other end of it. But hang in there, okay? So if you can just stay in shape, just try to, I mean, once you get in shape, try to stay in shape. And all it takes is one to two hard workouts a week to um, sustain your fitness level. So um, try to work out first thing in the morning because I know that when I say I'm going to do it later, I don't. Um, you know, things come up, you know, your, your schedule's busy, you never know, um, and you're tired at night. So if you really want to make it a priority in your life to work out, do it first thing. I mean, I know I'm crazy, but I will literally get up at 3 in the morning if I have to to get it in to start my day um, because I just have so much more energy, even getting up at that time if I get my workout, on, workout in first. Now, I can do it later if I'm meeting somebody, but if not, i got to do it first thing in the morning. Um, eat enough. You know, a lot of people, when they go on uh, these diets, they cut their calories so low that their body thinks it's starving, and so their mes metabolism just shuts down and holds on to everything, holds on to fat. So eat a lot of the right stuff. Um, I can't tell you how many people make this mistake where they just – cut their calories way too much and then their metabolism just shuts down. So make sure you eat enough. Um, make fitness fun. Find things you like to do. There's a zillion ways to get in shape. You don't have to do, you don't have to run, you don't have to lift. You can do all kinds of things. Just be active. So find what you enjoy. You'll stick with it then. Um, and then also with eating, plan, plan a way that you can stick with and that you can make it a lifestyle. I mean, there's a million diets out there. There's a million different ways to do it. You know, there's the South Beach. There's the eight-hour diet where you eat for eight hours and you fast for 16. I mean, there's the low carb. I mean, a zillion things. But find what you enjoy. If, if you're not a big meat eater, then you probably don't want to do the high-protein diet, all right? But you can still look great and be in great shape doing something different. So um, just find a diet or a way of eating that fits your lifestyle. Um, in closing, you know, I, I might not have reached my ultimate goal of uh, being, an Olympian, uh, being an Olympian, but because I strive for such a lofty goal, um, I met many people along the way, and, and I accomplished a lot, and I challenge you to go after your goals, whatever they may be, even if they're not practical, um, because one of my favorite quotes is, I'd much rather fail at attempting something great than succeed at doing nothing at all, and, uh, you know, just continue to, to stay positive through the tough times, and, and, you know, one thing that um, someone said that really hit me. They said, you know, uh, don't, if you live in the past, you're not going to fulfill your destiny. All right. So we all have things that, you know, we might regret, but, you know, let it go, you know, because you're not going to be as good as you could be if you don't. So, um, uh, that's all I have for today, but, um, thank you for, um, being a great audience. So.